Hey, I'm back. I have a tripod again. I'm so thankful. So now I can sit on my bed and film videos, which is really comfortable for me. I asked on TikTok Live, uh, what do you want to hear from me? And people said that the most interesting thing for them to hear about is personal style. I wanted to talk about designers, so I'm going to talk about how you can pull from certain designers, aspects of constructing your own personal style by attaching to their philosophies, sensibilities, and sensibilities and philosophies you can just pick out of their brand. Source, I made it up. And that's something you can do. Things don't have to be like somebody wrote out a manifesto about why they're designing what they're designing and then you attach to that and then that becomes your manifesto. Like things can be a little bit more ambiguous now. Okay, let's just jump into it. The first three references on the screen, keep these in mind throughout, but are Snake Guy, Horse Girls, and Extreme Face Tuners. Um, these I think, these are different groups of people essentially that I feel like allow you to tap into larger philosophies and sensibilities in terms of developing your personal style. I'll try to reference them throughout, but Snake Guy refers to people who have those body modifications where their tongue is split and then they have bumps under their skin and they've modified themselves, tattooed their eyes, tattooed their teeth or whatever else. Uh, body modifications are humanly or not humanly possible in order to divest from like living in this corporal existence in the way that everybody else does and it's because maybe they challenge the concept of being born into a body who said that they wanted to be born not them they wanted to be a snake and they're a person and that's not fair and they're victims but do you know what I mean like if somebody wants to be a snake person for example maybe they're fine with being a person and they want to be a person who's modified to look like a snake but there are some people who feel really divested from the concept of being born into a body they have no control over and wanting to change that and um, it's not just that they want to for themselves, but sometimes people want to do it as an act of like political resistance or structural resistance against whatever this earth experience is. And um, that's sometimes a thing. Horse girls, I think horse girls are, I know that's right, make some noise for horse girls. I think horse girls are radical environmentalists who confront the public with our relationship with nature rather than allowing us to feel alienated from nature by wearing horse girl culture, horse girl couture even one could call it. They are forcing you to confront the fact that we are one with nature, we are a part of nature, horses are a part of nature, and you can't just forget that they exist because you're in your urban city, in your life, you know? They're saying, you know what, you need to think about the grass, the grassy plains and the horses that have the intelligence of a 10 year old child, by the way, which is very uncomfortable. Um, okay, and then the last one is extreme face tuners. Again, sometimes um, people are reconstructing identity online because they are politically divesting from the social structures that we have. Sometimes people just really don't like their own appearance or have other issues or whatever, but sometimes people are doing those identities online where they face tune like themselves and create a separate identity from their real life identity and they're not trying to look real or human. They're saying like, I want to reconstruct the concept of existence, humanity, digital existence, etc., etc. And they're doing this huge thing to challenge those systems. And those are ways of developing like identity, like fashioning identity that can relate to personal style. We're gonna jump into the first designer now. Okay, so the first designer that I wanted to talk about is Rei Kawakubo of Comme des Garçons. And I want to pull from Fashion, Desire, and Anxiety by Rebecca Arnold, one of my favorite books, I always recommend it. Um, it talks about how Rei Kawakubo of Comme des Garçons distrusts the excesses of the decadence of couture. The book says that she imbues her design with age, compounding the natural with the technological to produce clothing which acknowledges human frailty and creates an aesthetic of decay. Such work may be a signifier of a type of fashion held back from the abyss of continual repetition where the hell of postmodern city life may exhibit mortality and a reunion with the realities of decay and the body. This is one way of looking at your relationship with like her relationship with design and her relationship with constructing art in terms of business and production, but also one way of you looking at reconstructing your relationship with getting dressed. Like a lot of designers and artists do the patina aging in order to signify the value in something aging, the value in something having have having been lived in and having longevity, and they create fake signs of wear in order to indicate and reflect real wear or real longevity in certain garments to remind us of like our existence you know our 
reality, our ability, our mortality, essentially, sorry, I can think of the word, our mortality and to confront us with our own mortality, our own aging, our own decay, and how that can feel like it's rapidly increasing in these urban industrialized contexts and how those contexts impact us um, really deeply. And that's something that you can represent with your fashion. These are things that you can internalize about your own reality, if this is the case, if it is your own reality, and use fashion to explore. In general, Rebecca Arnold talks about how 1990s fashion images presented a vision that acknowledged and made explicit both the violence of contemporary life and the emphasis this places upon our own physical frailty. And this is something that I talked about um, on TikTok in terms of the Jurgen Teller aesthetic, the Mucha Prada, Mew Mew and Prada aesthetics, some of the more subdued, um, kind of less conventional forms of art making and fashion that are really really present right now that I think are making people really uncomfortable because they do uh, confront people with their own mortality their own decay the impact of urban living the impact of capitalism etc I think that people being confronted with those forms of art and fashion images it makes them uncomfortable because it's not something that you're expected to see I think sometimes fashion images can make us feel like we are immortal we are perfect or we're striving for perfection which will lead to somehow immortality um, and like seeing images where women look like dolls or fembots, robots, um, non-human entities, impossible to achieve um, entities, it, it can make you feel like this once you keep working and working and working toward it, one day you will reach that level of perfection and then everything will be resolved and you won't have to be faced with the reality of life, which is that we will actually get older, we will actually get further from these standards of beauty, and then we will eventually um, decay in our own ways. Um, <laughs> I think that um, seeing and being presented with other forms of conceptualizing reality is a way of fashioning identity for yourself and doing it through your garments and your wear. It doesn't have to be so literal like apocalyptic dystopian like we're all gonna be gone from this world soon but it, it definitely can be uh, done through things like patina, things like aging. You can see this in some of Margiela's work in terms of wear. Um, and I just think that this is a way of reconceptualizing fashioning identity that isn't so conventional and isn't just buying into a brand because it's weird and different and not what other brands are doing. What about it isn't what other brands are doing, right? So why is this different than Hyper Glam Versace, David LaChapelle, stylized photography um, and what about that has value and what about that resonates with you and doesn't and then you can look at this what about this resonates with you and doesn't what about this constructs an idea of reality that you could attach to or even challenge but still want to represent in your clothing I also appreciate Rebecca Arnold talking about how the work from Comme des Garçons seeks to highlight the aging process and bring out flaws and weaknesses in humans and human frailty uh, in its existence because these are all things that you can highlight and address. I also think the fact that um, Comme des Garçons is seen as like this really strong challenging brand, I think that Comme des Garçons constantly challenging the constructions of identity through masculinity, through femininity. I think that that actually reveals how weak we are as a society and as a global society historically, that we have to create these distinctions in order to maintain some sense of order instead of having the, the mental strength to have freedom and acceptance. And I think that that's kind of what the work reveals as well. And so I think that that's something that you can definitely attach to in your personal style, where you're revealing our flaws and weaknesses as societies by uh, working to examine singular constructions of gender that are not inclusive you know that's what you're attacking it's not just like I'm wearing something that not everybody wears it's like I'm wearing something that not everybody wears isn't that weird that that's something that we do as humans that we limit ourselves when we could have so much freedom and acceptance and camaraderie and joy and peace in this life and you're challenging all of this this is much larger philosophical structures than just being like not everybody else is wearing this boys don't usually wear skirts girls don't usually wear pants you know what I mean and then in terms of bodily existence, I think Comme des Garçons can also encourage the viewer to reconstruct the concept of a body through like spring 1997 lumps and bumps, through some of the more political messaging, through the appendages that are on the clothes or the reconstructions of shape, or even um, some of the references to the historical constructions of shape and body. I think that the all of these forms of design can encourage the wearer to question mortality, corporal existence, the construction of the body, typical bodies, conventionality, standardized 
uh, garment making, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And these are things that you can also shape your personal style around. Investigating and questioning. What about having a body means that we have to dress it within the confines of garment construction and tailoring that we know to be standard. Who's to say you can't have lumps and bumps? How come everybody doesn't have lumps and bumps on their body? How we could focus our attention elsewhere if we reconstructed our ideas of the body, how we could focus our attention elsewhere on actually resolving things with our body, like in terms of health and um, things like that, that aren't so focused on standardized constructions of beauty. And I think you can use your personal style to investigate that concept. In um, Rebecca Arnold's book, Fashion Designs and Anxiety, she essentially talks about how Margiela and Ray Kawakuba at Comme de Gasson honor the body through cocooning it because it's not the conventional way of designing um, and it's not like how Dior and other couturiers construct the idea of perfecting the body through the couture design. It's a way of saying like, actually, your body might be perfect just without our clothes, which is very <laughs> unconventional in terms of fashion design. Your body might be perfect without our clothes. This is just a way of uh, homing your body, cocooning your body within our designs, but there's nothing you need to change about your body. That's a really, it shouldn't be, but that is a really like challenging perception in fashion, frankly. Okay, another designer, I'm not gonna go too deep into because I wanna make a full video on Ishii, but Ishii, Yasuyuki Ishii, I've made, um, I think I talked about in a couple of my other videos about why I wear certain designers, but his work is very centered on, in my opinion, like the organic, organic textiles, the organic appearance of leather, kind of like Frankensteining together different pieces of leather, which I think forces you to confront, um, again, your corporal existence, mortality, the organic, the living world around us, and um, nature, and how things exist naturally, which I think can build, for me, the reason why it really resonated with me is like, it rebuilt my relationship with myself and my appearance naturally, which I know is weird, but I saw this like Frankenstein, like jacket of just like different kinds of leather that are pieced together, and there are different textures and different animals and different kinds of leather. And I was like, this reminds me of me. And it kind of shows the impact of like wear on the animal skin in a way that a lot of other like luxury leather does not because it makes you think about um, you know, the processes that go into constructing these kinds of pieces. I love Ishii, we're gonna talk about it at another time. But that's just one example. We're moving on to Issei Miyake. For some reason, the first sentence underneath this bullet is horse girl pilled, confronting people with nature, natural dyes, images of nature. <laughs> they, there are just so many different ways of reconceptualizing environmentalism through the work of Issei Miyake in a way that I feel like confronts you with not only um, nature, but human, processes in developing garments and textiles, which I think a lot of people leave out. I think when people think of textile innovation, they're thinking of like, who has the most money? Because then they would have the most technology and the most tech people, and then they can make a new textile. Meanwhile, Issey Miyake was working with his hands and having um, like the team at Issey Miyake, like Dai Fujiwara and um, Naoki Takazawa, working with their hands and the entire team working with their hands and physically scrunching and pulling and turning things in Issey Miyake moves. You can see them physically figuring out the best way to make these clothes. And um, I don't know, I think that when you're confronted with that based on your own research and you can value that, it builds your relationship with your wardrobe so much more intensely than just being like, I'm wearing please please because it's different than how most clothes look and it's cool. And it signals to an in-group of people who know what please please is. Like that's obviously valuable and I understand social belonging as it relates to fashion. Building that relationship with human processes and the human involvement in garment making, I think that that's one aspect of design that you can build your personal style around. And then in terms of Issey Miyake's design being environmental and how you can reconceptualize that for your personal style, in that article they talk about how he uses simplicity in his design and how that can be connected to environmentalism and ease and function and serving my life and freedom that comes with being able to focus on other things when I'm not keeping up with all of the trends as they change, and you're symbolizing that political divestment from the fashion system in wearing something simple. I think that that's another way of thinking about your personal style, where you're you're just symbolizing. The next designer is Margiela. So I talked about Margiela for an hour in my last video about a designer, um, but I'm going to speak briefly <laughs> still about um, Margiela and temporality and fragility of human life, mortality, corporal existence. Margiela at the House of Margiela does so many designs that involve symbolizing wear and the impact of human life on 
garments and the world and the reality. Margiela's entire office was painted white. There's also a Margiela show that I read about, I think it was in the 90s, where everybody was coming into the show and they were still painting everything white as the runway show was supposed to have started. So there's like journalists like sitting there while they're just painting things white and making sure everything is like blanched out completely. Um, and when you paint things white, not only can the white crackle off and break off of the garment and show signs of wear, but it also can like show dirt and show impact. I think it's not just a way of symbolizing, you know, that you like seeing signs of wear because it shows that it's worn, but I think it's a way of, again, grappling with time. One thing about Margiela, it was always giving time. It was always giving what time is it? Summertime, summer vacation. Um, but I think that I, Margiela is a lot about grappling with time, challenging the concept of time, um, refusing to accept time as it is, and like contemplating what is time and why. Um, I think it honors your time on earth and the time before you to consider time and to not just accept the present for, as it is, for what it is, because what is it? Because what is it? Time. because not only is it the case that it shows how long you've had something but I've said this before it can be fake like you can fake wear you can fake signs of wear you can have clothes that are pre-deconstructed and pre-destructed I used to intern at this denim wash house and they would like like just riven and destroy and rip and cut and bleach and put holes in things so it made it look like somebody had these pants for 20 years and I just watched someone sew them right in front of me and I think that the signs of wear on some of the Margiela pieces act the same <clears throat> when they use vintage fabrics and vintage garments. You are not only extending the lifetime of that garment, but you're also extending like its relationship with another person, which means that we're also questioning and having this different relationship with time because it means that they're not trapped in the concept of um, like a trend historically. So this is a quote from Fashioning Memory by Hike Jens, who I also quoted in my Margiela book, but this is a different source text and I just think it's incredible. They're, it's always the same fashion girlies. It says, fashion is understood to immerse us in the now by generating distance to the past and a desire to forget. Every new fashion is a refusal to inherit a subversion against the oppression of the preceding fashion. This is from Roland Barthes in 1990. So it says, inherent is continuation of a narrative of modernity, idealizing ideas of newness and progress, promoting a perspective on time or temporality that undermines the dynamic role of the past as constitutive to the present. Constant, constitutive means having the power to give organized existence to something. So like constitutes it. Edward Casey says, remembering happens continually. So the capacity of memory is limited. We forget more than we remember. So there's a perpetual interaction between remembering and forgetting. Okay, so then it also says, on the subject of memory, it says nonlinearity, partiality, revisionary capacity. The working of memory shares similarity with the visual material culture of clothing and fashion, but clothing and fashion can be understood as constitutive components of personal and cultural memory. Um, I also said before the symbolic resistance of trends in relation to resisting concepts of time I think is central to understanding the House of Margiela, but I think I've explained that enough. You're just not submitting to the trend changes. So as fashion changes, you're like, I'm not just going to change because times are changing in fashion. Fashion is a construct that we make um, and our relationship with time and the seasons as it relates to fashion is something that we choose to do. We do these seasons fall, winter, spring, summer, but it could be fall, winter, spring, summer every five years. That's how fashion could move but we choose not to and that's our choice and you can say I'm divesting from that and symbolize that through your wear. The next designer is Jean-Paul Gaultier. I have been working to build my collection of Jean-Paul Gaultier pieces really intensely lately. I like that Jean-Paul Gaultier's work explores so many different aspects of existence. I'm not going to go into all of them as I'm not for any of these designers. These are just ways of thinking. But I think that his work investigates the boundaries between private and public life, wanting and waiting, versus flamboyance and being out there. Heider Ackerman did Jean-Paul Gaultier's most recent couture show as a guest designer, and he was talking about the lack of desire that social media and our current culture uh, creates and how there's very little opportunity to want and desire and wait for something because everything is so in your face and immediate. And this is also something AF Vanderbost designers talked about before their uh, house shut down recently. 
And they were saying like there's essentially no desire at this point in fashion or in the world because everything is so instant and immediate. And I think the way that John Paul Gaultier's runway shows and couture shows construct desire is this really interesting balance of like being revealing and sharing, but also hiding so much. I also think just generally balancing opposites is something John Paul Gaultier does really well, like preserving uh, constructs of tailoring and dressmaking tradition by being this master couturier, doing couture shows, having such a skilled atelier uh, designing the clothes versus being super innovative with his design all at once. Like you're doing these experimental weird designs, you're uh, casting diversely on the runway across all axes, but you're also adhering to these conventions of dressmaking and tailoring where the clothes look perfect. Heider Ackerman talked about wanting to reveal Jean Paul Gaultier's purity and the documentary about Jean Paul Gaultier worked to explore his private and personal side and I think that that's something that a lot of people are interested in seeing into and getting some insight into and I think that that's the the boundary that he kind of creates between private and public life where he is this very jovial silly person who has this like funny, contagious laughter, but also for some reason people who are close to him are interested in what's behind that and what's even deeper because apparently he has this very, very big heart and he's always connecting to people. Glenn Martin's worked for Jean-Paul Gaultier before moving to Y Project and he said that Jean-Paul Gaultier was always like super celebratory and lively and not to say that that's bad or wrong or weird, but like I think that's so beautiful. What motivates someone to always want to create life and laughter and joy in a room and like what's behind all of that? I wonder and I think that's a way of exploring your personal style is thinking about the ways that you want to balance your private with your personal life, whether that's through desirability and racism or whether that's through like sharing different aspects of your personality and hiding other aspects of your personality through getting dressed. I also love that Rebecca Arnold talked about self reflexivity and self scrutiny through sheer garments because I think that, but I think that Jean Paul Gaultier wields this really, really strategically. Like I said, the, the balance between public and private layering and concealing and revealing um, in his dressing of the models on the runway. And I, I think that that's directly connected to um, interrogation. I love when he does suiting on women um, it's always so perfectly, sharply tailored, it's sometimes de deconstructed and reconstructed, and it's not only encouraging you to investigate gender, but it also, like, to me, creates the desire that Heider Ackerman was talking about, where you want to understand a little bit more about the person wearing it, is what I'll say. Yoji Yamamoto does this very well as well, in terms of layering clothes on a woman's body and constructing desirability in these unconventional ways um, that make you want to know more about the wearer. And that's something that you can create through getting dressed, evoking desire in a way that is not so conventional um, as uh, the universal ways we think of, especially in terms of women wear, women's wear. And I think John Paul Gaultier's work also challenged morality and continues to challenge morality um, and the higher structures. He said he doesn't do it for no reason, though. He's like, I'm not trying to be provocative just to make quote unquote provocative clothes. He's like, I'm challenging, you know, these conservative structures that are saying this is only one way to be. He's like, well, why? And I think that that's another really real way of getting dressed is challenging morality. Who's to say that something is moral or immoral? And there's ways of doing that, because I've talked about Rick Owens, which I'm gonna talk about next, where he, Rick Owens does it in a way that's kind of like silly and campy, like him always doing the pentagrams. He's being funny, but like that's a way of challenging morality in your getting dressed. And it's not just um, attaching to the way the symbols look, but you know, valuing what they mean lar in a larger context. Um, Multiplicity, I think Jean-Paul Gaultier's work <laughs> is like the best symbol of multiplicity of identity uh, ever because it is always so much in so many different directions, communicating so many different things. It doesn't mean your full expression of yourself has to mean you're a maximalist, you're wearing a ton of colors and you're layering a million things. It can mean um, that your multiplicity is your quiet side, your shy side. <laughs> Um, and then strength and security in times of instability, which goes back to my video about Sleaze and Margiela, where I feel like sometimes people attach to these more extreme identities in insecure times, which I think the house of Jean-Paul Gaultier does a really great job at. I think that's part of why I'm attaching to it. The next designer is Rick Owens. I already have an entire video about Rick Owens, so I just think control and freedom are aspects of his design that you can definitely take from. I'm gonna also link my video on Rick Owens if you want to know more about what I think uh, about his design and how it affects the way that I get dressed and why I wear his clothes, but I think his 
um, conservative upbringing and then complete experience of freedom it seemed in his um, 20s and older and then his ability to go back to kind of a conservative lifestyle with this massive freedom and appreciation of bringing people around beauty to enjoy it and celebrate it in all these different ways. I think I think that all of these things in combination are things that I attach to and I think these are things that would resonate with other people. So you can watch my video or watch his interviews where he talks about um, his relationship with like restriction and uh, release and freedom. But I think Rick Owens is a massive demonstration, like I said before, of um, self-esteem more than anything and wielding aspects of your identity strategically to best express yourself and I think that that's also something that you can do in fashion you know not feeling like you've failed or done something wrong because you've made mistakes in your life or had an imperfect life or have experienced trauma or pain instead wielding those things to share them with other people and bring people around the beauty of how you want to share those things. I think that that's what his work does. And I think that that's absolutely something that you can demonstrate in the way that you get dressed. You guys, we're, we're at the home stretch. It's giving a home stretch. The next designer is Andy Mila Meester. Andy Mila Meester, I think her work conveys a sense of romance and relationships, like her relationship with her family, her relationship with each piece that she designs, her relationship with each collection that she designs, her trust in the designers that take over at her fashion house is like a symbol of her um, ability to emphasize relationships. Poetry, rock, and alternative music, alternative lifestyle and identity, freedom, restriction, conscious dressing, and rejecting consumerism. I talked on TikTok about how Sometimes people attach to minimalism, not because they like the appearance of minimal looking clothes, but in order to divest from the larger systems that create these massive uh, expectations of consumption and participation in trend cycles. And they demand your attention on fashion in a way that maybe is not healthy for everybody or productive for everybody. And I think that Anna Mila Meester's work being so consistent and uh, working to solve practical problems in their design and provide quality garments. I think that this is a way of rejecting consumerism and att attracting an audience that actually values garment construction and identity in these like dark, poetic, gothic, romantic um, aesthetics, but it's not in a way that means constantly consuming for the sake of consuming. Um, and Rebecca Arnold's Fashion Desire and Anxiety, when talking about Andrew Milmeister and some of the other Belgian designers, talks about how Elizabeth Wilson, who I mentioned, or talked about it uh, in terms of aestheticizing despair or dystopian attitudes, um, and described it as symptomatic of a late 20th century malaise of postmodern experience, which I feel like we've exhausted the topic of. The world is what it is, and you can convey that by escaping it, um, reflecting it, or um, embracing it or like you don't really have much of another choice or doing all at once or you know having any combination of those things but you know I think that this is definitely an option reflecting it that this is how the world is and this is your response to it um I also think that her work involves a lot of like self-trust and integrity like I think her fashion house maintains the integrity of its identity regardless of how trends change while still being contemporary but I think uh, I read an interview from Andy Meester where she talks about how her clothes would still suit fashion today and she doesn't think about when she did her retrospective she wasn't thinking about like these are clothes from way 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 back in the past she thought of the garments as her friends but she also thought of them as her friends that she keeps along with her and I think that that's something that you can see in her work if you have a consistent brand identity and if you have a consistent identity and design, it could mean and point to the fact that you find value in what you had to say in the first place, even if that's not exactly where you still are in life, like from 20 years ago and 30 years ago. But yeah, those are some designers and some examples of how you can pick up on a brand's philosophy or interpret a brand's philosophy or do research on a brand's philosophy to um, adapt their philosophies to your archive of clothing and what your sensibilities are in terms of getting dressed. This is what I mean by attaching to larger sensibilities and philosophies when getting dressed and fashioning identity rather than um, buying into trends and things like that. Like none of it can't be that every single one of these things works for every single person who watches this video. And I think that that's valuable. It means that you have a place in 
some of these ideas or none of these ideas. Maybe you watch this and you're like, and that's all great for those people. None of those things resonate with me. That's important because that'll help you figure out why clothes do resonate with you, in my opinion, sometimes. Um, I want to lean my flowers off of the wall because I'm scared that they're going to imprint on the wall. So I'm actually going to finish this. I'm going to politely end this call, like I used to say at my old job. I'm going to politely end this call. It was really great talking, great chatting. Um, message me on Instagram if you have any questions. I'm usually on my phone. Much love, peace and love. I'm going to answer some work emails and then I'm going to edit this. Bye.